afternoon, folks. Downtown Honolulu, Ted Rawson here, your host on Where the Road Leads at the Think Tech Hawaii Studios, uh, a, a show that uh, looks at how the intersection occurs between technology and life and the quality of life here in Hawaii. But it, more important than that, our show is, as you know, is, uh, is, is uh, calibrated by the quality of the guests we manage to bring on. And today we have Doug Main. Doug, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ted. Great uh, to be here. Doug is the uh, is the administrator yes. of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Yes. It used, used to be, to be called known. Civil Defense. State Civil Defense. All of right. us growing up here would have thought of it as Civil Defense. In fact, your email address still is Civil Defense. It is. I, we're so. slowly changing over from the old to the new. Uh, we're, we're going through a, really a two-year process of change, so uh, getting people to get to know and love the new Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Is there a different mission in the Emergency Management Agency versus Civil Defense? Nope, it's the same mission. Uh, we're here to uh, help the Hawaii Ohana prepare for, uh, respond to, and recover from disasters. And, and that is our mission. Our mission is to support people, to support the counties, uh, and help them uh, prepare and then uh, respond to save lives, mitigate suffering. And that's, uh, that brings us to the point of uh, Makani Pahili yep. and Vigilant Guard, which are starting up tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's right. And uh, this is the annual exercise that pulls all this together and tests things out, and lets new people become involved in some way. Right. And we've uh, we've conducted Makani Pahili, which is our annual hurricane exercise. This is our 21st year. So we started shortly after Aniki, uh, which uh, certainly showed us some issues we had with uh, hurricane preparedness in the state. We have, uh, this year, we have a very large National Guard component to this exercise called Vigilant Guard. Is it more than, Guard. more than Hawaii Guard? Is there other guards? Yes, other we, states coming yes in? they, they uh, are drawing in, I think, 14 or 15 other states are sending uh, That's different unreal. components. That's right. It's, it's a, a, a specifically funded exercise through the National Guard Bureau for uh, Hawaii uh, National Guard and other National Guard uh, states to specifically support Domestic operations, what well, they call domestic operations. Well, those 14 or 15 other states, will they be all concentrated here on Oahu, or are they spread apart? They're, they're spreading them across the island. So uh, we should have uh, different components on uh, each of the islands, supporting each of the counties. The, the state and federal agencies, our job is to go in and support the local uh, first responders and the local incident commanders as they uh, respond to emergencies that arise during disasters. So that's right. So the, the state sits above the county and then the guard is next to be called. Is that kind of how it works? Well, yeah, the yeah. So, so, right. So the, um, we like to say all disasters are local because they start in the local area and the counties, uh, local government counties in our case, have the vast majority of the resources that are needed to respond to disasters. So as the disaster occurs, the counties uh, have their resources that they employ, and as they start running short of resources or as they identify things that they need, then they turn to us and they ask the state to help them with providing resources. And we have state government, we have state resources we can call on and provide, but we also have a huge uh, partner in, our, in federal agencies that can also provide assistance. So once the situation gets beyond what the state can handle, then you turn to the Guard. To, well, no. So part of our state response actions is to employ the National Guard as a state agency. In the state, agency, state, state, in the state, state funding and state rules. Right? Correct. Yeah. And, and uh, another piece of the state government, uh, of the state level actions, is an agreement that we have with all 50 states and a number of the territories to share resources between the states. So we can employ uh, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, and we can go to, uh, we basically broadcast a need, and other states then can provide the need. So for example, we might need additional staffing for our emergency operations centers. We can put that, we can broadcast that need through a uh, system that's part of the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, and other states will respond and provide resources, and then they send the resources, and we employ them. So it's great. It's it's worked out very well. It's it's been in place uh, shortly after Hurricane Andrew. They started building this uh, this compact, and it's worked extraordinarily well for Sandy, for uh, Katrina, for the larger disasters. So the Hawaii Guard might find itself supporting some other activity or some other emergency in some other state by that right. same pact. Right, and it's not only the National Guard that's shared, but it's it's other state resources. So, mm. for example, during Tropical Storm Izell last year, we actually brought in a 10-person team from four different states to assist us at, this, at the state headquarters. Um, and their job would be to uh, assist us with ordering and tracking these resources coming in from other states. 
We have also provided support during, uh, trop during Superstorm Sandy. We sent two people to New York, and uh, during some flooding in the state of Alaska, we also sent some of my staff out to support uh, the state of Alaska. This is a really sort of a complicated, uh, interdependent set of relationships and things that are making this happen. It so is, so. and, and the, um, we used to, states share resources normally, but this really codified the approach. And, and the main thing um, about sharing resources is who pays. Oh, so yeah, Who's going to pay the bill? Books and right, and, and that's, the that's a large portion, a large part of the compact is the agreement on, on how you request and then how you reimburse and who's going to reimburse and the negotiations that take place because different states pay their employees different salaries. So that's all part of this discussion of bringing resources in. However, the main thing is, and, and what we found during uh, Tropical Storm Izell last year is when, when push comes to shove, no one really cares at that point in time how much it costs. What you have to do is get the resources, and you have to get them in the most expeditious manner and employ them in the best way possible. And, and that's really the focus. The focus is to identify resources, ask for resources, bring the resources in, and then employ them at the local level so that they're the most, we make the most efficient use of them. And so Vigilant Guard and Makani Pahili will exercise some of that. In they terms do, of the yes. Piece. Yes, and, and so um, Makani Pahili is a statewide exercise. Uh, the, uh, we have participation in each of the county EOCs. The State Emergency Operations Center is activated. We have a lot of the state agencies, our nonprofit partners, private sector partners, all participating. And the goal is to work through all of our coordination issues, identify um, information requirements that we have, ide and identify holes in our plans and holes in our ability to execute but so we can make them better. There must be some scenario or some way this activity starts, like it's starting tomorrow. Right. For it's, example, it's, we uh, it, the, the first on the ground activities start tomorrow. We actually had a briefing today um, on, the, on the approaching storm. So uh, Hurricane Makani is approaching in the exercise. And so we go through all the steps that we always go through. And, and this is a culmination of a year-long planning process. It's a, it's a large team. I've got a full-time exercise planner, and this is her major job. And the uh, planning, I su suspect, for this year benefits from things that were discovered last year. And it last does. Year's yes, and we build every year. We take the lessons learned every year and, and build them in, um, both to our staff processes and into the exercise design and how we execute the exercise. So the exercise starts tomorrow with the, uh, the pre-warning or the alert of the, of the impending arrival of the hurricane. Right, and the National Guard is doing a, a lot of training, and their, their staff is forming up, and they're getting prepared to uh, support the um, operation. Will this be largely tabletop and that, that sort of thing? Or there's actually, actually a, there's a large full-scale component to this. So, so there will actually, actually be moving, equipment moving and that's right. There will actually be teams moving around. Uh, they will have a number of urban search and rescue teams out uh, working on different collapse structure piles we have around the state. Um, there is a uh, community point of distribution exercise uh, that the Red Cross is involved in. I think in. that's the one that my wife Margie and I are going to be involved in next week, next weekend in mm -hmm. Waimanalo. Very well I understand done. we're going to be doing amateur radio support for the Red Cross and that distribution system. Right. And uh, thanks to Margie for leading us into that activity in Waimanalo. And thanks right. to Frencha and yeah. Kevin and the gang for making yeah, Waimanalo the, what it is today. Waimanalo is a, a great example of a community that has decided to, to enter in, to, to become more resilient. And it's been a huge success working with them for uh, over a year now. Uh, Kevin Richards and mm -hmm. uh, the Hawaii Hazards Awareness and Resilience Program with Frencha and her team out there, and w Waimanalo is just doing wonderful things. So what will people see? What will people see in terms of uh, uh, Assembly of National Guard people or Assembly of State people, emergency op centers stood up? What will we see as we drive around? Uh, you know, quite frankly, the, the average citizen probably won't see a whole lot. A lot of the, uh, most of the National Guard activities will be taking place either on National Guard property or uh, uh, police training property or fire training property. So you, you're not going to see um, vehicles rolling okay. through the streets. Um, each of the emergency operations centers will be uh, doing training and will be activating at various times. Again, that's all kind of internal to, to wherever the emergency operations centers are. Uh, and, and then you will, there will be some, like in Waimanalo, they'll be doing a uh, preparedness exercise so in Waimanalo, you might see people moving around the streets and other things. But 
Again, not a, there isn't a huge footprint that's actually out in the, in the public visible. Wouldn't it be nice to sort of find a way to communicate out to the public exactly what's going on and let them be aware that the efforts put forth on their behalf are, are being exercised and practiced in the anticipation of things happening in the, in the hurricane season? I, yeah, we're, we're doing a public outreach campaign on uh, advertising what is going on. The National Guard always does a, a huge push uh, through their uh, press releases and uh, onto their Facebook pages and their, through their social media outlets. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we have not made a big uh, concerted press uh, effort this year. Last year we had a very large Makani Pahili exercise. We had over 3,000 uh, people involved in that. It's smaller this year? It, it, is, it is smaller. There's a larger military component, but uh, last year was, a, was an all-out effort because we were testing all of the county catastrophic hurricane plans. And so we had a, we had a very big push for the county EOCs to run multiple days and for uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and our federal partners came in very heavily to support the exercise. Uh, we still have our federal partners on board. They're, they're supporting this exercise, but it's, again, it's a much smaller footprint. Um, it's appropriate to the size and, and to what we ask for and what we need. But nevertheless, it's a really in incredibly deep and, and uh, designed and shared and, and flexible and adaptable set of, of support relationships that are going on here that are uh, well, yeah, didn't and the, happen overnight. Right, and the, and, the, and the continuing building the relationships is, is as important, as, quite frankly, as anything else that we're doing. Um, so... But we're lucky here because we do have these long, deep relationships with our partners, and they've only been getting stronger over the past few years as we've been, as we have been exercising more and more, and seeing them, seeing all of our partners in more and more uh, different venues. For example, we've we have a concerted outreach to the private sector to involve uh, uh, all the uh, different private sector organizations in helping us with our plan. Uh, this past year, for the past year, we've been working very heavily on a post-impact tourist evacuation plan that's involved the airport, it's involved the airlines, it's involved the, the hotel and visitor industry, and it's, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. Uh, we know that we're going to have to move um, a couple of hundred thousand people off-island post-impact that are here visiting, and it's, it's a problem that we've, we've known about, and now we are continuing to develop a, a pretty detailed plan on how we're going to approach that. That's interesting because uh, certainly uh, if the other islands get hit, Oahu's got capability that can mm -hmm. pour forth. If Oahu gets hit... Uh, there is some capability can, that yeah. can come in from yeah. the outer islands. Uh, the, the issue really becomes um, if, uh, if the hurricane impacts everybody and impacts everybody fairly severely and then uh, we can't, it's difficult to shift from one island to another. It's now everybody's impacted. So. Where is the help coming from? How do we get it here? How do we, how do we get the people that are on island that we need to get off island off and out as, as expeditiously as possible? And that's really just to relieve the burden on the lifelines. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, about how the guard and the and the in, in the in the state mode and the guard in the when activated in the federal mode uh, play together here at sort of at the end game. Of this, uh, of this response sequence, but we'll take a break and come right back and talk about that. Certainly. Might be able to get George online here, too, while we're, <laughs> while we're waiting. Hopefully. Get, should give us a minute, I think. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii, and I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. 
Good afternoon, folks. Uh, back live here, Ted Ralston, Doug Main uh, joining us, talking about Vigilant Guard, Makani Pahili, and recalling past activities and looking forward to this year's activities, yep. which uh, continue to impress me as, as kind of like a, a, a little bit of an insider, but a little, uh, mostly an outsider, just how complicated and how complex this whole relationship set is, uh, all the way up to activation of the Guard in, in, in federal service, for example. And all these pieces that have to play one on the other and in order. It is order. complex. But you guys manage it all and everybody understands it. It would, what, what goes through my mind again is how would we portray this to the average citizen in such a way that they would gain appreciation for what's going on. And uh, uh, as, as we were mentioning earlier um, in, in, the, in the earlier discussion about uh, the guard coming from maybe up to 15 states and some cases I was mentioning to Doug at break time that two years ago I was went over to do a piece of technology for uh, uh, Makani Pahili on Lanai and came across about 500 or 600 guardsmen from Connecticut and Tennessee and New York and other places on Lanai and I was struck by the fact that how how what the reach is for these things coming together and how people will how the organizations are designed to support each other and then how they actually make it happen during this exercise well, yeah, we work very hard on, on building relationships and understanding who's responsible for what. And, and it, part of that is also who's paying for what, because if you have the money, oftentimes you have the power. With the National Guard particularly, uh, and with federal military forces, uh, I can certainly talk about it, but it's, I'm not the expert, and uh, I would defer any questions, any specific questions to uh, the uh, Adjutant General, uh, General Logan, my boss, or the Deputy uh, Colonel Hara, or anyone in the, in the National Guard Joint Staff. However, so the National Guard typically conducts uh, disaster operations under, in a state status. So they're under, they're under the control of the governor, the governor's commander in chief, and the governor mobilizes them in order to uh, conduct disaster operations. So when we see the Guard out, we normally see that, that's what we'd be called state status. Right, they're, okay. they're, in, a, they're in a state status. Uh, we were talking about this the other day. Uh, I was talking about this the other day with General Logan and, and Colonel Hara, and because we were preparing a briefing for yesterday's senior leader workshop with the governor on hurricanes. Um, and you know, the fact of the matter is, most citizens don't care whether it's the National Guard or the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. They and, care and that they, someone's there helping. And they all look the same. And they all look the same. And they and it's funny. In in certain communities, everyone everyone in a uniform who's assisting is a guardsman or everyone who's assisting is an army guy or a marine, depending on what they're used to seeing. And, it's, it's, and I've been in this business uh, really since about 1990 when I joined the National Guard. And uh, so I'm a retired National Guardsman out of the state of Washington. We did a lot of disaster response, and that's what you see. So typically the, typically the, the National Guard is, is mobilized by the governor. They're, in, they're being paid for by the state. They're under command and control of the National Guard, chain, their normal chain of command. And that's what we see normally. That's Is what that we see. Normal and, operations. The, and what's happening now, and what has happened in the past, is that the National Guard would be doing a set of missions. And then, because there was so much need, uh, the federal military, uh, the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Marines, would also get mobilized, and they would be sent in, and they would conduct missions under their own chain of command. And oftentimes, the, the, there would be missions that went to the National Guard and went to the Army at the same time, and you'd end up with two units there doing one mission. It wasn't a very efficient use of resources. So a couple of years ago, there was an agreement that was made that whenever possible, actually it's the usual way of doing business, there will be one commander designated who will, who will have authority to command both National Guard and federal military forces. And that's, a, that's an important distinction, it is, isn't it? It, it is. It has to have qualifications and, right. and proper uh, administrative authority in both domains. Correct. And so typically it's a National Guard officer that is appointed. It's called a dual status commander. There's typically a National Guard officer appointed that, uh, to that command because uh, National Guardsmen, by their very nature, have the authority to command both uh, state military forces and federal military forces because they hold a federal commission also. Now, in one case, this has also, they also used a, they used a federal military uh, officer as the dual status commander, and National Guard forces fell under uh, that person uh, in, in one case. So the, the key really here is that we now have agreement that one officer 
is going to be in command and control of both National Guard forces and federal military forces uh, in order to ensure that they are used as effectively and as efficiently as possible. And that's typically a local guardsman. Typically, Who has yes. a local knowledge and typically local relationships and that sort so of thing. So in the case of Hawaii, um, uh, General Oliveira, uh, Bruce Oliveira, uh, who is the commander of the Army Guard, is the designated commander of the, wow, we got some music, uh, is the commander of the, he's the commander of the Army Guard, he is the designated dual status commander. And that's been agreed on by Pacific Command. It's been agreed off. It's signed off on by um, the Secretary of Defense. Um, so it's good to go. And that's and that's what they're practicing. They're practicing establishing this joint staff this weekend. And as these uh, Nas uh, National Guard from other states roll in and simulated the simulated federal forces um, are mobilized in support. Uh, will all fall under the Is that new enough staff. that it, it that it's well practiced? Or I'm, is it is it still looking for how to become real? That, that? Uh, there's they you they we uh, we started this actually uh, during the APEC conference. Uh, they used this construct, but it was brand new, and it's it's been used since then. But every state has to work through it on their own, and and. Uh, and I think it's very valuable. Uh, last year during the Kona PV, they established a, a, a dual status command. So this is the the fourth or fifth time that they at least they've worked through this. So process. we'll see this happen during this exercise. Yes. In this time, at some point in time, the heat gets hot, and uh, and the the governor calls upon the. That's exactly right. For, so and and we work very hard uh, on practicing the steps that we go through for a hurricane, and we have we have processes, we have checklists, and we know that starting five days out from from the impacts of a hurricane being felt the state staff is meeting with our federal with our local and federal partners we start daily meetings and we are already five days out we are taking action at that point in time to ensure the safety of our citizens what you can do is sort of anticipate when that handoff might occur uh, based on the almost a standard distribution of of intensity of an event and at some point right. in time it You'll, it's not going to be a surprise when you when you uh, or something like a hurricane. Yeah. But then we have no notice events. Also, we could have a tsunami where we have four hours notice, or a local tsunami that gets generated rapidly. Uh, we could have uh, a bomb go off. I, we could there. So there are no notice events where it's even more important that we have these relationships established, yep. that we practice stuff, and then we know who to pick up the phone and call. It just after having been through HARP and yeah. CERT out in Waimanalo, it just opened my eyes to how uh, these relationships and these these complexities and these dynamics play out. And, and this is a hundred times more involved than than one uh, one town's worth of activity. Right. So it, it almost needs a movie made about it or something like <laughs> that to, to, to give, give you guys all credit for what you've been doing and these. Uh, well, uh, th we have a lot of dedicated people in a lot of different organizations that are that are involved in this planning team, and this this um, they've been working for a year on this exercise. It's it's a uh, uh, it's kind of a never-ending treadmill that we enter, and so as soon as we complete Makani Pahili in ten days, we'll be right into the planning for next year's Makani Pahili, and we'll be we'll take the lessons learned. We'll look at which core capabilities we want to want to look at. We'll start, we'll start soliciting input from various organizations. We'll put a planning team together. And the planning team is 25 to 30 people. And they, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, and there's a lot of people that put a lot of hard effort from across. We've got private sector. We've got county. We've got federal. Uh, we've got nonprofit organizations. And they put a lot of effort and they take a lot of pride in this exercise. What I'd like to do is, is uh, kind of explore two things. First of all, what the specific events are. We have the title here, uh, right. Vigilant Guard, McConaughey Pekinley, but there's a lot under that title in terms Correct. of individual activities. Then I'd like to think a little bit about how how people can become involved, how people can observe, how they can get information. And maybe they even, maybe there's folks out there with some technology that is even used on, and how do we, how do we find a way to inject that type of technology in? I uh, just throw one example out there. We, we came across some superb software down here in Honolulu just a month ago. Ocean that makes it, and it pulls, it, it extracts features out of out of video in, in real time. That is, if you are looking for a certain issue, uh, straight lines or damaged buildings or something, instead of a human looking at the video, you can put a number of filters on the on the processing, and you can have the software itself in real time pull out 
features that indicate something to you. So if he can train the software to find the markers you're looking for, and that takes a whole person out of the equation, or another way to look at it, it, it uh, speeds up the process of the person becoming vectored into where the incident is, is or where the, where the important aspect is that he's looking at. So that's just one example, but there must be, especially as we go forth in the world of, well, one of my favorite subjects, UAVs, and George Purdy, who might be joining us, uh, although perhaps not, also in that same way, but technology evolving has a way to in influence and, in and have some value here. I'd like to find a way to how that, that happens. But if you could take us through the sure. sequence of events so that everybody understands what, what Makani Fahili actually looks like, that would be really educational for us all. So um, Makani Pahili is the overall scope of the exercise. Uh, it's based off a hurricane and all of the subsequent actions and activities that take place are because of, of, of a large hurricane hitting the state of Hawaii. So we have uh, built really six different venues. And if you view them as connected through the scenario, but not necessarily tied to so each other. So the hurricane is a connector. Helps. Right, so, so the hurricane causes everything else. So we have the hurricane and that, the hurricane and its, and its impact preparing for the hurricane and then the damage caused by it and the impact that it has is what's really driving the county and the state uh, emergency management and civil defense staff right. to do what well, we do all the time. Driven. Right. So, um, so the, the, what the military is doing, what the National Guard has put together is they have um, a hazardous material, a series of hazardous material spills around the state that they have to respond to, uh, which again is caused by the hurricane. So that's a very specific set of circumstances that, that our civil support team, which is a National Guard element that does hazardous okay. material support. So they're responding to uh, Honolulu Harbor uh, because of a, a chlorine cylinder and it's causing contamination. So they have to respond to that. And then they also... Will there uh, be physical response to that? that yes, will, will that is, this is, so this is okay. full scale. So they okay. will actually go there. At the same time, and that will also force uh, Honolulu Harbor to close. So mm. on uh, a week from Friday, we'll be doing uh, what's called an alternate port exercise. So we have the ability to send ships into Pearl Harbor and offload them in Pearl Harbor rather than Honolulu Harbor. For so real? Or you can yeah. simulate that, aren't you? Well, we are, well, it's actually a full scale exercise. So we've loaded, uh, actually, the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard has done a great job in putting this exercise together. There will be a barge loaded that will move into Pearl Harbor that will be offloaded. You know, we need, we need an entire second show just to go through the script you've got here. But <laughs> it's quite let's, complex. Uh, let's, uh, it, it, it totally is. Let's, let's get back to this after okay. our next breaker. Certainly. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Friday afternoon, folks. Final segment of our show here today, where the road leads, and, and, and this road leads directly to Makana Pahili and Vigilant Guard starting tomorrow. Doug yep. Main from the, uh, the administrator of the Hawaii Emergency, Emergency Management, Management Agency, Agency, used to be called Civil Defense, is here beginning to take us through the script, if you will, of what Makani Pahili is all about this year. I was just pointing out as we had some time at break to look at it that in the collapse structure area, I've been asked by the, uh, in kind of an informal way, by some folks in, in uh, architecture at UH, how they could help with something like that. that oh, is, okay. Uh, aspects of damaged buildings are something that an architect can see that. Uh, other people might not quite see in terms of the structural uh, aspects. And so there could be some like rules of architecture reversed 
that would be then turned into indicators of structural damage and collapse. Building. Interesting. So okay. we'll, that's what I was referring to before, how technology can find its way in here. So anyway, take us, Doug had taken us through about one, one. third. <laughs> of the, Two of, of the, the six uh, scenarios. So we have one, one group of the National Guard, the civil support team, and there's actually multiple teams coming in. We'll be working uh, hazardous materials response, and that, that'll be full scale. We also have a group, uh, a, a larger unit called the Suburney Enhanced Response Force Package, and they do larger uh, has, hazmat responses and collapse structure. This is where the urban search and rescue capability of the National Guard sits. So they will be actually be working in rubble piles uh, and, and com conducting uh, so urban that's search real and rescue. Outside, USAR. That's, that's really outside. In, in yes. their PPE and everything. That's and right. They go there. in and they jack stuff up. Yeah. They rescue stuff. It's a it's a great uh, it's a great exercise. Now it will be full scale. We will also, based off the hurricane and, and um, poor health uh, after the hurricane sewers overflowed, we'll also have disease outbreaks. So, so there public be, health becomes a there'll factor. will be a public here. health issue, and and so we'll have medical teams in. Uh, working through the health issues. We are also bringing in, and, and, and at the same time, because of all this stuff going on, a bad actor at, uh, decides to take advantage and, and conduct a cyber attack. So we'll also have teams uh, conducting a cyber exercise and defending a network defense exercise. Um, and then finally, um, so t t the way, because we're here on Hawaii and we have Pacific Command here, usually our federal DOD forces that are provided to us come straight from Pacific Command. It's a very simple, uh, it's very easy for us to request forces and for <coughs> Pacific Command to approve use of forces for the National Guard. However, that we wanted, uh, uh, we wanted to try a little bit, the National Guard wanted to try a little bit more difficult route to get forces. So the sixth scenario is that Pacific Command is completely involved in a typhoon response to Guam and CNMI. Now, so they just had their a mind is of, elsewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, they, and they actually, uh, CNMI and Guam did just suffer a, a typhoon that went through a couple weeks ago. So, so with PACOM fully engaged in the Pacific, now, as we need federal military forces, we have to request them through NORTHCOM, North U.S. Northern Command, which provides disaster support because activities. Because PACOM is elsewhere. To the mainland, that's right. So, um, and that is a completely different set of approval authorities. That's a whole bunch of different relationships. And that's right. And that's part of, and that's, um, uh, that's why they wanted to go through this exercise was to start developing those relationships with uh, U.S. NORTHCOM and with the Secretary of Defense's office uh, in D.C. to work the approval processes for getting mainland title uh, federal military forces deployed out to uh, the Pacific. So within these six scenarios that are playing out here, uh, the National Guard's involved, and then the the, the county the counties, the counties are involved in their proper orientation and such. And that takes us to next Saturday in Waimanalo when yes. we do the national the uh, Red Cross uh, uh, food distribution system. <coughs> so that <coughs> Margie and I can be better prepared for that. Can you outline a little bit of what that might look like so we can have some time to think about it this week? Well, uh, so the counties are responsible for establishing community points of distribution. So they designate the location, and then uh, they, with help from their partners, provide uh, uh, commodities to be handed out to the public. Oftentimes, uh, the nonprofit agencies are either they're running it for them, or they are there providing. But the county their has own. a responsibility. But, the, but it's a county. It's a county responsibility. Now, the county might be. Uh, overwhelmed, and uh, in in the case of the city and county of Honolulu, they have 80 points of distribution that they have designated. So they, it would be very difficult for them to run 80 points of distribution. That's a huge amount of staffing that's required. So they very well could turn to the Red Cross and say, "Look, we can't do this. Can you do this?" And the Red Cross, which means they say, have sure. a pre-existing relationship, right? An MOUs or something like and that. And the Red Cross would go in and establish it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the details of that exercise. However, the, the requirements to establish the point of distribution and then walk people through it uh, and then report the information up, the, that's really the key piece for okay. us. So it's, um, going to be, it's going to be an actual field exercise of some I believe kind. so, yeah. Margie and I will be doing radio communication. Right. So we'll be taking requests for information or for support, I guess, and standardizing the message form and passing it on to somebody who can take action. Correct, and, and a large part of our exercises that we build in is uh, communications outages. Mm -hmm. 
So <laughs> typically we start with internet's out, phone lines are out. Um, so we're, we rely on the amateur radio system to provide information. And, and there's a great capability that we have across all of the islands as a, uh, as a backup communication system. And so we, we will, uh, on Wednesday next week, when we do our first day of post-impact uh, emergency operations center support, that's all being done under uh, communications uh, problems. So we'll be using our satellite phones, we'll be using uh, all of our backup communications, including amateur radio. Well, that's a really interesting comment. So the, the, the hurricane hits tomorrow. Uh, the hurricane hits actually Monday night. And Tuesday then by morning. Wednesday we're into post, uh, we're right. into post event uh, right. recovery and, and such. Right. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me also is that we have an organization right here in town called the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, NDPDC. Yes. In fact, I've seen you over there. At right, the Carl Kim. Right, that yeah, much. Under the UH, yeah. Uh, are, are, are they involved in, in, uh, in observing this or? Not that I know of. Uh, last year they were very involved okay. in, in a number of different ways. And um, they uh, do a lot of training for That's us. That's what I was Yeah, they do a lot of training courses and other things. Well, and um, it's a relationship that, that is very strong and that we're exploring to, to expand in, a, in kind of some non-traditional ways. Um, but currently, uh, they're not involved um, that I know of, certainly in the, in the EOCs and other things. They, they could have a, a training role somewhere else. They could be out in the communities doing some stuff. Well, it would be interesting to have them observe what's going on and use that to alter or adjust or improve the training they're, they're the two have to go right operations and training have to kind of know about each other right they're they're a great resource no doubt that's cool and there's also a lot of good technology as I mentioned about the uh, feature extraction on a video mm -hmm. which uh, that gets back to the issue of technology and that gets back to George Purdy who's not on the line who's a STEM <laughs> activist on, Ma on Lanai I met right. him two years ago at Makani Banyuli and his idea is incredible take these opportunities for public service public support turn them into interest points for students in school, academic uh, level as well as scholastic level, and turn these into programs where, once again, STEM and interest in STEM can be generated, and then capability can be brought forward and find a way to um, enter the mix here. I mean, certainly all the technology that's in these exercises today came through some mechanism. Right. And uh, there's more technology emerging, and it would be interesting, maybe offline here, we'll talk sometime about how to find a way where the technology providers can can see what's needed over here in a way that uh, the two can be coupled in a, in a positive uh, positive gain feedback loop. As well, you, say. you know, the, what, I, what I find as I spend more and more time in, in this business is there's always another group of people that we need to be talking to. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's we another need to make a sector, movie. yeah, there, you know, there's another sector we should be in, including. Uh, there's there's um, another group and finding venues to bring people in and, and is, is really difficult. We're, t we're trying through our community outreach uh, and what I would encourage is at, as these community groups that are either established or are establishing, establishing themselves start working towards resilience that we, we point towards some of the private sector companies that are in their areas uh, and try to get them involved at the community level also and, and see what's there. Uh, I think you were talking about Oceanit with their, yeah. uh, you know, Oceanit is work also working on some uh, uh, basically cell phone charging towers, solar powered cell phone charging towers that also produce a local mesh network for uh, cell phones uh, and other devices to connect Plus, to. Mercy, I'm sure you've come across Yeah, we, and we use Mercy, yeah. yeah. Uh, that is a, an Oceanit, uh, that's our damage assessment platform right. that we use. So there are, and there are a, a ton of other organizations out there that have great ideas. And a lot of times it's a matter of getting them known, getting them seen, but then also working out a way to, uh, to develop the, whatever it is. What if, you know, once again, it's, you know, we've spent this entire time talking about one page here. <laughs> There's a lot more to go here. <laughs> well, we, we won't get the rest into of it is one, just details. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking that uh, maybe when, uh, a month from now or so, when this is all history, it would be interesting to uh, get a couple of people together, you and some other folks, and, sure. and just go over where
where the gaps are that you might have seen that, that the technology providers at the university level and at the local companies might, might be interested in, you know, just to see what we can do. No, I think it's uh, the more we talk about this, the more we reach out to our, our entire community, the more solutions we find. Some solutions are high tech and some solutions are low tech. Okay. And, and this will be, the things we do here in Hawaii would be obviously designed for solutions in Hawaii. They may not apply in New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, as solutions in New Hampshire may not apply here. So having a lot of local interest in coupling together the users, which would be you and all the people you represent, and the, and the potential suppliers of, of systems and capability would be an interesting thing to, uh, to, to proceed with. But, I, I and think. the solutions we find here might be extraordinarily applicable applicable across the Pacific. Pacific in particular, and right. And actually Alaska. We have a lot of similarities with Alaska other than the weather. And uh, you know, we've actually got some interesting couplings with Alaska coming yeah. up in the, in the world of unmanned air vehicles, which we'll talk about at some point in time. So that brings us to a close of the intro to uh, Vigilant Guard and Makani Pehili. And a month from now, we'll ask you to come back. Sure. And we'll talk Always about happy. what came out of that. And we'll get some uh, some uh, supplier side on the, at the same time and, and have that, that conversation. So once again, Doug, thank you so much thank for you coming Ted. on. Appreciate really uh, appreciate the time you spent with us here and this insight, which is into a really complicated but important activity starting tomorrow. Makani Pahili and Vigilant Guard. And with that, folks, uh, look for the folks in your neighborhood that are involved in emergency operations, the CERT people, the HARP people, Guard, and uh, guard in all colors in the uh, state function and uh, in the federal function and uh, observe and behave and be participate in vigilant guard and McCondy be to the extent you can. That's right and if you and see someone out there don't be afraid to go up and ask them what they're doing. That's pretty And cool. how can you okay, get that's, involved? Uh, that's great. That is fantastic. And with that we'll uh, leave it and uh, see Doug back here in about a month and everybody else will see you next Friday. Thanks very much. Ted Ralston, Doug Main, we're signing off once again. Thank Thanks. You very much.